I've learned many wonderful things working in developing countries, helping children born with cleft lip or palate, and working with skilled colleagues and international volunteers. But it's also showed me the severe side effects of our standard preoperative fasting regimens. These were put in place with the best of intentions, but may result in severely dehydrated infants arriving in the OR after 16 or 20 hours of fasting. I've seen some small children arrive in pre-shock and require an intraosseous access. And this is a completely unnecessary ordeal and risk for this thirsty little patient in Kenya. And it's completely unnecessary also for your patients. Let's change the fasting regimens. Nil by mouth after midnight is a practice that is over half a century old. It has its benefits. It's an easy rule to explain and enforce. It allows for flexibility with the day's surgical program. But they may look good on paper, but quite not so in practice. Hundreds of thousands of children are fasting too long for their elective procedures. And in the end, this comes at a price. A price paid by our patients like this little fellow. These are the current American and European Society of Anesthesia guidelines, the so-called 642. That's fasting six hours for solids, four hours for breast milk, and two hours for clear fluids. When they were introduced, they were a great step forward. No more nail by mouth from midnight. But in the real world, fasting from midnight proved to be a habit surprisingly hard to break. Children are fasting much longer than 642. Several audits of fasting times have been published during the past decade. These audits capture actual mean fasting times our young patients endure. They're as high as 10 hours for solids and 6 to 12 hours for fluids. Many patients were fasting even longer. 12 to 15 hours was not uncommon. But is fasting so bad? Spiritual leaders of old would uh, abstain from food for weeks when they needed to get things right. No, fasting may be a fruitful path, path towards spiritual enlightenment, but it's not a suitable preparation for surgery, especially not in children. Infants and malnourished children run the risk of developing severe hypoglycemia. Furthermore, mitochondria starved for glucose turn to fatty acids for substrate, and the metabolism goes catabolic. This may be in a child who's waiting to undergo major surgery, which can be in itself an enormous strain on the physiology. We wouldn't fast a child that's preparing for a big race. Their bodies wouldn't be optimally prepared. Then, why would we allow that to happen to a child going into surgery? Now, this is the guiding principle behind the enhanced recovery after surgery paradigm. If we minimize our tampering with normal physiology, we get less complications and a faster recovery. So, what's the rationale behind the 642? The, on the most fundamental level, anesthesia blunts or abolishes the airway reflexes, putting the child at risk of regurgitation of gastric content. Fasting regimens aim to ensure that there's no stomach content to regurgitate. So why is regurgitation during induction dangerous? Well, if it fills up the lungs, it'll cause a local chemical inflammation and a systemic inflammatory response that we call the Mendelssohn syndrome. Mendelssohn was a New York obstetrician who reported a series of 39,000 caesarean sections in which there were 66 cases of aspiration pneumonia. All of these patients survived. He also performed animal experiments work that showed that it was caused by aspiration of gastric acid. The series also revealed two deaths due to airway obstruction by remains of solid food. And this is a principally different and much more lethal pathological mechanism. Mendelssohn's paper subsequently led to the nil by mouth from midnight rule that prevailed from the 60s until the first modern fasting guidelines were published by the ASA in 98.
How common is pulmonary aspiration in the perioperative period? Well, a recent report from the US Wake Up Safe Registry analyzed 2.4 million anesthesia. They found 135 cases of aspiration, which amounts to an overall incidence of 1 in 16,000 anesthetics. Half of the incidents had serious consequences, including two deaths, sadly. Their multivariate analysis of the 135 cases confirmed the known risk factors. Emergency surgery was associated with a two-fold increased risk of aspiration. An ASA class of 3 to 4, that's significant comorbidity, increased the risk by 5. A majority of these aspirations occur during induction, but also during maintenance, emergence, and even pre-induction or in the PACU. A good portion also had stomach contents for the simple reason that they'd sneaked in a breakfast when they should have been fasting. Now, the good news is that if this nil paros violation was a clear fluid, it did not seem to cause aspiration pneumonia. And this is an important point when it comes to fasting regimens. It's solids we should focus on when we talk about high-risk induction due to a recent meal, not clear fluids. Many of the patients found in the study had a gastrointestinal comorbidity. Now, these children may very well have delayed gastric emptying, so solids remain for much longer than six hours. Many of the patients found in the study had a gastrointestinal comorbidity. Now, these children may very well have delayed gastric emptying, so solids remain much longer than six hours. That's why we intubate them using a rapid sequence induction protocol. Ileus, intubate. High dose opioids, intubate. Gastrointestinal motility disorder, intubate. What I'm trying to say is that factors besides the actual fasting regimen may be more important for the risk of aspiration. Now, healthy elected patients is a totally different matter. In order to understand how a fasting regimen should be designed for these healthy elective patients, we need to understand the physiology of gastric emptying. We can plot the gastric content volume on the y-axis and time from ingestion on the x-axis. When solids enter the stomach, there's a lag phase of up to one hour uh, before the emptying starts. And total emptying time depends on the caloric density of the meal a large meal will stay in the stomach for a very long time, even more than six hours. Beck and co-workers have shown, on the contrary, that a single sandwich with spread is gone within four hours in most children. But when considering solids, we have to worry about the problem of inter-individual variability in gastric emptying. And we do need more research in this field. Clear fluids follow first-order kinetics with a half-time of 10 to 20 minutes. Now, if you do the math, you see that there's very little left of a glass of water after half an hour. Now, this is why two hours of fasting for clear fluids is clearly overdoing it. Milk and other semi-solids are a mix of water and a small amount of solids. So you get a curve that has intermediate characteristics. The yellow curve in between indicates that a reasonable amount of milk is cleared within three or four hours. In Uppsala, about 20 years ago, we changed our fasting regimen because we realized four things. One, it's logistically impossible to design a system to tell children to stop drinking exactly two hours before their anesthesia induction. Two, there's no proven association between drinking clear fluids and the risk of aspiration. Clear fluids do not increase the risk of aspiration. It's the remains of solid food that we should worry about when it comes to aspiration risk. And the more calorie-rich a meal, the longer it takes to clear from the stomach. So, let the kids drink. Number four, we have to have rules that are easy to understand and enforce. Otherwise, we'll have compliance problems. So, we changed our local 642 guideline to what we call 
640. No solid food after midnight. And solids is any food you normally chew. For infants and for afternoon cases of any age, we actually prescribe breast milk, infant formula, or even yogurt for four hours before anesthesia induction. And most importantly, we let the children drink clear fluids until they're called to the OR, which is normally 30 minutes about before induction. Now, was this such a radical change? I'd call it evolution and not revolution. And after this talk, I hope you'll agree with me. But is it safe? We published an audit of this practice in Uppsala in 2015 and studied more than 10,000 patients. We found a 1% rate of vomiting, mostly at induction, 14 cases of clinical regurgitation leading to coughing and bucking, and three cases of pulmonary aspiration diagnosed with postoperative chest X-ray. Three aspirations in 10,000 is more than the wake up safe report, but in line with most other studies. There were no deaths and there were no unplanned admissions to intensive care due to these aspiration pneumonias, which we're happy to say. In a follow up study, we recorded fasting times in our ENT and plastic surgery unit that was still implementing the 642 regimen. Now, you see the wide range of fasting times around the mean value of about four hours. After introducing the 640, mean fasting times were down to only one hour. More importantly, look at all these children fasting for six hours or more in the left pane. With a new fasting regimen, the proportion of very long fasting time was reduced from 38 to only 6%. And this is the great benefit of the 640. By not setting a time limit, we don't have to figure out when the patients have to stop drinking. And they drink only when they're thirsty. But if the 640 feels like going too far, consider this. Several influential centers have also changed their fasting regimens and published their results. Great Ormond Street in London, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and followed by a number of centers in Switzerland, Holland, and Germany. A consensus statement from the ESPA, together with the British and French Pediatric Anesthesia Societies, has facilitated acceptance of the 641 regimen in several European countries. The possibility to offer outpatient children a drink when they arrive at the hospital makes a huge difference to simplify nil per os orders, and mean fasting times come down significantly. This is applying the science, and this is better care for our patients. The European Society of Anesthesiology has set up a task force performing a systematic review of the literature about preoperative fasting and gastric emptying. The aim is publishing new fasting guidelines. We're looking at the feasibility and safety of liberal fasting regimens, the impact of comorbidity and type of food on gastric emptying, and the role of gastric ultrasound in excluding a full stomach. We hope to have completed this work by the end of the year. And we want to learn more. In the Eurofast project, we aim to prospectively audit at least 120,000 pediatric anesthetics regarding fasting times and respiratory adverse events. Several Swedish centers are participating, but we invite centers anywhere to join us. So, in conclusion, more liberal preoperative fasting regimens for clear fluids and perhaps semi-solids seem to be safe in children and definitely have logistical advantages. Fasting times are often way too long, and it's your responsibility to get together pediatricians, surgeons, and anesthetists to make a concerted effort to bring them down. Your patients deserve it. However, Regardless of the fasting interval you impose, there's no guarantee that every child would have an empty stomach. And we, what we anesthetists need to do is ensure a smooth induction to minimize the risk of vomiting. But patients with real risk factors for aspiration need to be identified and managed sensibly. Join us in the Eurofast study to audit the effects of reduced fasting intervals. 
And for myself, I recommend the 640.